Hi everyone, it's Vanessa. Today I wanted to do a discussion video about the limits of nonfiction, some of the problems that I sometimes have in nonfiction. And this was really encapsulated in two books that I read recently, which are Plunder, which is a memoir of family property and Nazi treasure by Menachem Kaiser, and also We Keep the Dead Close, a murder at Harvard and a half century of silence by Becky Cooper. Uh, this video isn't really a review of these two books, but I did think that these books made me think about storytelling in nonfiction and it made me want to have this discussion about nonfiction and some of the biases that sometimes might exist in nonfiction. Part 1. There are no true stories. There are only facts and the stories we tell ourselves about those facts. We keep the dead close. Whenever I talk about nonfiction on my channel, I describe it as, you know, truth is stranger than fiction and that's why I love it so much. And these are like real people that exist in the world and I think that's fascinating. I also think nonfiction is really good at setting the stakes and making you care. Um, kind of going back to the fact that you are placing, being placed in somebody else's shoes. It makes you care because it is real. But I do think that nonfiction generally can have some limits. The placement of information and the order of information in a book done in a way to create a story to create a narrative arc that goes from A to B to C. Sometimes that is frustrating because then you get to the end of the book and you see kind of not how you were manipulated but how the truth and the facts were manipulated to make you feel a certain way or to make you think a certain way throughout the whole text. It's important to think about nonfiction as sometimes speculating. For example, in a true crime book like We Keep the Dead Close, speculating about who might have done this murder, it might hurt the people that are in the story and omitting facts or omitting evidence because it doesn't fit the narrative that you're trying to present as a storyteller. I always read, even fiction, I read through a critical lens or I try to all the time. I value in nonfiction when authors are upfront about the limits of their writing and what things that they cannot ascertain. Part two, Menachem Kaiser and Becky Cooper. So next, let's talk about Becky Cooper and Menachem Kaiser, who are the authors of these two books. I'll briefly mention what these books are kind of about. If I don't, this won't make any sense. Um, so We Keep the Dead Close looks into a cold case of a murder of a, an archaeology student in a graduate program at Harvard in 1969, and it was a very, very cold case, and it was only just solved in 2018, so it was almost unsolved for 40 years. And this really was known to the author because she went to Harvard and heard about this story kind of through like the folklore of the campus and just hearing creepy stories about Harvard in general. And so then she wanted to find out more about it. In this whole ginormous like 430 page book, it's her thinking about Jane Britton who is the woman that was murdered but also thinking about her place at Harvard as an archaeology student, what that institution was like for women and the sexism that was encountered by many women then and now when it comes to academia. Plunder is by Menachem Kaiser and this book is supposedly a look into Nazi treasure as the author is trying to reclaim his family's property in Poland. So his family owned this property before World War II and before his family was sent to concentration camps. It's him learning about this and his family has resettled in Canada wanting to place an inheritance claim to try to get the family property back. Of course, this property is now lived in by other people, so that causes some kind of ethical questions, um, but also there is a lot of spiels in this about Nazi treasure and Nazi tunnels that were being created by labor from Jews that were sent to the camps. Also, a very particular book that he learns about while he is in Poland with these treasure hunters by Abraham Kaiser, who is a first cousin of his grandfather who survived the war. He wrote this whole memoir of his experience in the camps and all the different camps that he went to and he had no idea until he met with all of these Nazi treasure hunters that they were connected. Part 2, Section 1, The Seduction of Narrative People are more than symbols. Not everything has thematic heft. The tools of storytelling can blind us from the truth. How then do you tell a responsible story about the past after all? We keep the dead close. 
The way that Becky Cooper and Menachem Kaiser look at nonfiction is fascinating because throughout the entirety of both books, I would say they are constantly questioning themselves and their motives. And for understanding that they cannot tell the full story of something that is historical and where things have been lost to time. Becky Cooper in particular talks about something that she labels the seduction of narrative. And the seduction of narrative is this idea of how the story should go. Throughout the whole book, she in particularly settles on three suspects and she keeps pulling these strands and trying to convince you that it could be one of these three men that might have killed Jane Britton. This narrative is seducing because it makes you as a reader feel like you're learning the clues and like you're piecing together this true crime story. She has a moment in here where she says to herself, there had never been any puzzle to be solved and no code to decipher. A lot of the times we want this larger than life story from specifically true crime. The human elements, the people that are a part of these stories uh, are second to the narrative and we are seduced. In Plunder, we want Kaiser to regain the family property. So when we're reading Plunder, we want him at the end of the story, we want the narrative to be that he finally got back the family property that was lost during the Holocaust. Historical reconstruction in general is just really difficult because there are parts where the information that you have is very rich and detailed and very full and then there are other elements of your story where that information is very sparse so it doesn't neatly tie in a bow. Part 2, Section 2, Myth Making and Errors most stories in most families aren't meant or relied on as preservation of hard information. They're meant and relied on as preservation of soft information, of sentiment, narrative, identity, who someone was, and subsequently who you are. It tells not a historical truth, but an emotional truth. Next, I wanted to talk about myth making and errors. Both of these books really talk about myth and how myth is created over time. It becomes less about truth and more about this story that has been passed down through the generations. In We Keep the Dead Close, we talk a lot about Boston and Harvard, how the idea of Jane Britton being murdered was passed on as a cautionary tale to women of how difficult it is to make it into academia as a woman, especially in such a tight knit little claustrophobic department as archaeology is. In Plunder, we talk a lot about myth making in the sense of how Nazi treasure hunters um, a lot of the times like push aside the fact that the things that they are looking for, the things that they are trying to find when they are digging all these tunnels and finding random places in Poland, they were created on the backs of Jews and people who were sent to concentration camps. I think a lot of it is lost and the myth becomes like the tangible gold that they're trying to find in these tunnels and also just the fact that errors will exist in stories that are historical. The story of Jane Britton was passed down, a lot of things were wrong, but it's still interesting how stories over time change to fit the ideas that humans want to make about a situation that they are in or an institution that they are a part of. Part 2, Section 3, Memory Descents aka Memory Journeys I get why we write these stories this way. It's what's expected, it's what works, it's what's most suspenseful and most accessible and most marketable. Plunder. Another thing that they really focus on is this idea of memory descents, and I think Menachem Kaiser does that more so than Becky Cooper. Memory journeys are the idea that you're going on an adventure to solve something, and you are doing it in a very linear way. Both of them are on a journey. The story that you are reading is fascinating and interesting because you are on a journey. In Plunder, we do this by going to every concentration camp that Abraham Kaiser was in that he wrote about in his memoir and Kaiser recreates this journey by going to the physical locations and we feel like going to these physical locations is supposed to give us a bigger sense of what Abraham Kaiser went through. Also in this book we talk a lot about the Polish legal system and the bureaucratic system in the way that he is trying to reclaim this family property and it's also kind of like the steps to get to that family property that are really described here. Menachem Kaiser is trying to say that we we like to have kind of like a plan of action and you want to surmount obstacles when you're going to those places and you want to discover clues as you're going to these places. Same thing in this book as we're learning more clues about the case and who might have been involved and why could they have been involved. It's not that clear cut and simple to just go to a place or to read all of the materials about a case. It's a lot more complicated when you actually start writing your nonfiction book. Part 2, Section 4, The Storyteller. The act of interpretation molds the facts in service of the storyteller. We keep the dead close.
Last but not least, I wanted to talk about the impact of the storyteller in the book. I am okay with a storyteller that acknowledges that some of the situations that they are writing are not the whole truth. And I think that's what I really valued about Plunder and We Keep the Dead Close. At the end of the day, they tried their best to tell the story as respectfully as they could, as truthfully as they could. I feel like by the, I don't know, 50th page of both of these books, I knew that these books were more about the personal and less about focusing singularly on these things that the blurbs say that you're doing, these adventures, these solving of cases that you think that you're doing. So I valued the fact that they told us up front, this, is, this isn't this is going to be just about me solving this or me retracing my parents, my grandparents' steps. This is going to be about me thinking about why it is that I am interested in this story. In both of these books, the storytellers are really uh, interrogating their own assumptions and their own purpose in writing these books. I think that studying and investigating stories we tell ourselves is really fascinating. So I like a lot of the times when maybe it's like the fourth wall is kind of being broken in a nonfiction book and the narrator understands that they do have a place in the story because why else are we hearing about this other than the fact that they are incredibly interested in it? Researching these stories has affected them personally as well. It is interesting to look into their purposes, their assumptions, the things that they thought that they were going to get, and kind of like the failures that they have faced writing these books, that they could not be a linear narrative creative nonfiction masterpiece. Nonfiction books can offer you other things, right? Like I, I read the jacket flap of this book and I read like a few reviews of this book and I thought that I was going into these books and I was gonna get this one thing. And what I got were other things, but I still liked those other things that I got. For that reason, I didn't feel like these two books were like a waste of my time. We get a discussion about sexism in academia. We get an, a discussion about the very murky history of Harvard and how they deal with sexism and how they deal with corruption and abuse. We also learn a lot about what it's like to be in the archaeology department and to go out on digs and to go to Iran specifically. And in Plunder we learn a lot about how a family that has been impacted by the Holocaust uh, exists today and lots of other little side tangents that I really valued like discussing conspiracy theories about the Holocaust and why it's important to debate those theories and those systems of beliefs. You also learn a lot about nostalgia and memory. Part 3. Final Thoughts. Ultimately, I think how nonfiction books excel is by the skill of the writer. Something to keep in mind as you read nonfiction, that yes, these are true stories and that makes it fascinating that this actually happened, but at the same time that because it is true, you can't necessarily expect the most amazing and the most like unheard of story. To make sure that it stays true, the authors have to be upfront about the limits of their writing and the limits of their research. They can't figure out every single thing. So let me know what you thought about what I just talked about. Um, have you read nonfiction books in this way where the authors kind of question themselves? Um, and also if you've read any of these two books, I'd like to know your thoughts as well. Like I said, not really reviews. I think I ended up giving this one three and a half and this one four stars. Um, but I still really valued my experience with both of these books. So thank you so much for watching my video. I will see you in my next one. Bye bye.